Greetings fellow pilots, my name is Commander Grey Wolf, and this is another Elite Dangerous video. Well, you join me on the bridge of a Lake on Spaceways Type 9 Heavy, and it is here that I will take you through all of the user interface elements that you'll find on the flight deck of any ship. This tutorial is intended to be a definitive guide for all new pilots out there getting to grips with the ship that they've just purchased, so they can become familiar with all the information that a flight deck can provide them. But I hope that there's a little bit of detail in there for the more experienced pilots they may find useful too. First, let's have a look at this composited view of the user interface panels you'll find on the bridge or cockpit of your ship. And there are seven key display areas that will give you various information relating to the tasks that they're there to provide. And we'll run through them just quickly now. On the far left is the targeting panel. Above and to the right of that is your comms panel. In the center, the heads up display. Below that is your forward console. At the bottom, the roll panel. Top right is the info panel. And on the far right is your systems panel. Now that's just a brief overview of all of these different areas and we'll go into more detail in a moment, but that just gives you a clear indication of the key areas that you'll interact with and on the bridge of your ship. Okay, so let's start with the targeting panel over on the left here. Now with all of the UI panels, uh, they are laid out in pretty similar fashion. So you're looking at, uh, uh, first of all, look at the tabs across the top to find the subsection that you're after and then work from the top down. So the first tab is around navigation. Now this deals with all areas of uh, localized navigation, um, specifically around the system that you're in, and it'll list the uh, astronomical bodies or stations that you can uh, target, uh, and they're listed in order of proximity to your current position. Below that, if we skip across and hop down, once we get past what's in the what can be found in the system you're in. It then starts to list the systems that are local to you and within one jump range. On the left hand column here, it'll tell you the location you're in. Under destination, when you plot a course, you'll, it'll tell you your next jump point and how many jumps you've got until you reach your final destination, depending on the route and the course that you plotted. You have the option here to set filters. Now that allows you to um, include or exclude various features um, at, within a system that can be found. Um, and sometimes that can be helpful uh, to clear up that navigational list uh, and, and filter out things that you don't want. By default, I always have the asteroid clusters switched off. Um, systems that have asteroid belts in them can have quite a great number of them. And if it's unexplored and if they're not fully listed and detailed, from your point of view, in terms of the expiration data that's available for you when you arrive in the system, you can get a long list of contacts where when you target them, you're constantly targeting asteroids uh, rather than perhaps a particular planet that you're, that you're after. So I find that it's a little bit easier to turn that off unless I am mining and I'm heading towards an asteroid, be asteroid belt. Similarly, if you want to uh, purely just look for something like signal sources or um, points of interest, or you want to exclude various features, this allows you to give that kind of control um, so that it clears up and tightens up that navigational list to just list what you want. But as I say, in this instance, um, I have it by default uh, with everything on except for asteroid clusters for the reasons I described. And resetting the filters is a quick way to just reset that back to normal again. You also here have access to the galaxy map, uh, the system map you're in, and the galactic powers. Now, if we move up to and across to the transactions tab, this is uh, an area where um, it'll list all active missions or bounties that you have on you, bounties and claims that you can make yourself. Uh, you can see I've got one uh, unclaimed one here for some uh, data point intel um, and any fines that you uh, accumulate here. So uh, the missions that you've, you've taken on will also include any that are active, that have been completed, that have been updated. This basically just gives you a full list 
of uh, the, the transactional history um, within um, any given particular faction uh, that you're dealing with at the time. The next tab across is your contacts. Now this will list uh, any ships, settlements, spaceports um, that you are within the immediate vicinity of, that your sensor range can actually pick up um, and it'll allow you to select and target them. Um, right now we're at an engineer's base so this is the only thing that we're able to, to select once you move um, into the localized airspace and then into super cruise or uh, around an nav beacon or a starport these are times when you'll see lots of different contacts appear in this list and this enables you to actually target them specifically um, this is particularly handy if you're in an environment where say perhaps you're in a navigational beacon and you want to target specific types of ships or a specific person um, this allows you to actually have that kind of detailed information. Once you select a particular ship, information about that ship uh, or the station or whatever it is you've selected will appear on the right hand side and it'll give you information about um, uh, the, if it's an example of a ship that you, you selected, who the pilot is, what their name is, what their current combat rank is, um, what ship they're flying and um, if you're using a kill warrant scanner um, this will tell you this this is the area that will give you that information once you've completed the scan as to whether they have any any bounties on them in other systems next after contacts is the sub targets tab and the inventory tab now you see that these are currently um, greyed out because they're not currently selectable these become active firstly with the sub targets once you target another ship um, you're able to actually, uh, the, com the ship will complete a scan of that ship. Uh, you do have to be roughly pointing in the direction of the ship that you've targeted, um, which is a little bit of a, uh, an odd restriction for a, uh, a scanning system on a ship in the 34th century, uh, seeing as modern day fighters can scan in any direction um, in the year we're in currently now. But nevertheless, that's a feature of the game. You do have to be roughly pointing at the ship once that scan's complete. It'll compile a list of all of the modules and weapons and utilities that is on that ship and can be found on that ship and present them in a sub-targets list. This will then allow you to uh, select a particular critical system and then that information is passed on to the targeting computer uh, and your weapon systems will train to that uh, particular target if you're using gimbaled or turreted weapons. Um, fixed is uh, the aiming is down to you, obviously. Uh, but that's what the sub targets tab shows you. The inventory tab uh, relates to cargo scanners, uh, manifest scanners. Um, once you complete a scan on a ship, it'll, it'll give you an inventory of uh, what it's carrying, basically. And that allows you to see whether, if you're looking to do some pirating, uh, whether it's a ship that's worth going after. And uh, we'll see once we take off and look at some of the other uh, user interface systems. Uh, in situ in flight, uh, we'll perhaps have a, have a look at that um, in action, but that's basically what those tabs and those sections of the targeting panel do. Now let's take a look at the comms panel. Now as the name suggests, this particular user interface panel handles all areas of communication within the game, from player to player, to ship to ship, and also multi-crew. As with the targeting panel, the different categories that it uh, covers are listed along the top from left to right, in this instance in icon form. Once a player selects the area they want to deal with, you then work from the top down in the same way. And the first uh, panel that you can interact with um, is the text chat, the comms feed. This is basically a chat back and forth between uh, players or between players and NPCs, which includes pilots or flight controllers and such. The conversation is grouped um, like a messaging app um, with, with particular comments from either one party grouped together so you can easily follow the thread of conversation. Um, just for a quick example, I can then activate the text field here and type away below um, and then and post it and it joins my, that initial con, uh, comment that I made um, a little earlier. This is also where um, uh, tells you whether player, players that you're friends with have come online or offline and what their current status is. 
Next is multi-crew. Now there are three initial subheadings that you're, uh, you're greeted with. Firstly, uh, info, which gives you an overall um, uh, rundown on what multi-crew is about. The initial info tab talks about the rewards and, uh, and, and um, additional features that you can enjoy when you uh, take part in a multi-crew session. And it also gives a list of all the ships that um, will allow a session to take place. Then it splits it down into the three areas that a player can participate in within multi-crew. Firstly is helm and the duties that surround that particular role in piloting the ship or the gunner. If you take on that role you can get an idea of the sort of areas that you'll be um, uh, expected to deal with and uh, what your responsibilities are. And lastly the uh, the fighter pilot for those ships that are equipped with a ship launched fighter um, you can uh, get an idea of what that involves as well. So that just gives you a rundown on multi-crew itself. Find a crew. This section allows you to open up your ship for a multi-crew session. Um, and you can select the activity that you're planning to take place um, and then that tells the server uh, to match players that are wanting to also take part in that activity. So, for example, if you want to go bounty hunting, those players wanting to join a, a, someone else's ship to do bounty hunting are then married with your uh, your, your server request. Um, the initial activities here, bounty hunting, piracy, and mentoring a player, the further description in the field below is, is given in bullet point form just to give you a better idea of what that involves and further activities list additional gameplay areas that you can also partake in. Community goals are also available um, for multi-crew and um, are updated depending on what's currently going on within the CGs within the bubble. But then this just allows you to set your ship up for a multi-crew session and designate the, the play parameters that you'd like to um, open the ship up to. Now if we hop down to that and go down to join another ship, this is almost really the reverse way around. So this is where you want to join somebody else's ship and um, select the area of uh, gameplay that you want to take part in in someone else's ship. And again, the server will then try to marry you up with other players uh, in the area that um, maybe um, wanted to partake in that same gameplay. At this current time there isn't any, but this is where you would do that um, for that particular reason. So hop back down to the back, move to the next section. This is your inbox. So this is where wing requests, friend requests, um, any, any sort of personal messages between players uh, takes place. Um, it just works like the inbox of an email, um, email account. Next is, is your contact history. This basically just lists uh, the player commanders that um, you've uh, come into contact with or you've been in the, the immediate vicinity of at uh, various times um, and dates. And it gives you, um, by selecting them, uh, the ability to block them, report them, or send them a request. Just, just general levels of communication that you expect with any peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer or play-to-play -play, um, activity. The next section here is your uh, mission inbox. Um, so when uh, the NPC characters uh, want to communicate with you, update you with missions, or if you um, download any um, data um, from scanning beacons, all of that information, um, that microdata, or that um, from, from data link points, or from um, mission givers at stations, all come in via this inbox. It's, it's almost like an NPC inbox uh, variant of um, your your player inbox, uh, two tabs across. Um, you can see here I have uh, recently visited one of the generation ships, and it um, gives me uh, access to those audio files there, which I can listen to. Lastly is your settings. This allows you to manage the settings for um, for wing requests, for voice texts, um, um, allowing and enabling and disabling um, uh, voice and text messages from various other players. The info panel up on the top right is the one user interface area that you don't directly interact with during flight operations. Uh, it's there more as a passive feed of information, um, just alerting you to various events or activities 
um, during the operation of your ship. Uh, constant areas of info will be the, the name of your ship um, and the current game time, and then below that it will list things uh, like whether you've um, discovered some new astronomical bodies, or whether you're um, under attack, or whether your the heat levels of your ship are getting too high. Um, if you're jumping to the next system, it gives some information on the star type, and uh, just, just general and ancillary supporting information that uh, you might be useful as you take part in a variety of activities. Um, as I said, from exploration to combat um, to uh, docking with a station, it'll 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 be a little background supply of information that just lists itself. Um, up on that top right. There's no way of accessing it or um, uh, cycling back through previous information. It just appears and then will hang there for um, a short amount of time, maybe about 10 seconds, and then just disappear. Uh, so that really just covers uh, what happens with the info panel. Below your forward console is the roll panel. Now the roll panel really deals with all additional vehicles and crew that have been um, equipped or assigned to your ship and list them accordingly. Now, as before, we work across the top in the different sections and read down from there. So the first section just lists all of the uh, current available uh, vehicles and equipment uh, that are equipped with this ship. So in this instance, I have a single fighter hangar bay um, and an SRV uh, garage that has is able to hold two vehicles, which you can see here. Um, by cycling through them, it lists their um, current shield strength, hull strength, um, the fuel levels. Uh, with the fighter, it tells you what type of fighter it is and how it's uh, armed uh, with and what utilities it has. Um, also, the helmsman gives you some basic information on yourself as well. If we move across then to the helm tab, this allows you to first of all give some information on the actual ship itself and you can switch between um, yourself and any crewmen that you have uh, on board um, to take control of, of a ship launched fighter should you have one deployed. The fighter tab uh, deals with the deployment, retrieval and orders of a ship launched fighter. Um, we're docked with a, uh, in a base at the moment, so it can't be deployed, but uh, when you do, it gives you the option to uh, either deploy the ship yourself or with the crew member that you have assigned to the ship. Um, remember that you cannot assign uh, a, a crew member to take control of the ship if they're not currently active within the ship. So you must remember when you go into Starport Services to, to set your crew member, if you have one hired, as active. Um, and then they'll join you on the ship and are available to be uh, assigned to that fighter. So it's in this section here that you will deal with uh, all of those areas. And this also includes switching between um, the helm and the fighter position, which is what you can do with yourself and your crew member. And also it gives you a list of orders uh, on how to, if you want the crew member that's piloting the fighter to behave in terms of aggressive, defensive and so on. Next we move to the SRV section, so this really deals specifically with SRVs and allows you to select a particular SRV and deploy it accordingly. Um, as we are at a, a, a spaceport at a base, we can deploy uh, the surface recon vehicle, uh, which we could do by selecting this, um, and then that will then um, transfer you into that SRV. Um, further details on the vehicle can be uh, obtained here, and um, this is where you, you manage all SRV activity. Lastly is the crew tab. Now I have, uh, Landon Wolf has been with me for a little while and he is the crew member that I have hired and have assigned with me uh, onto the ship. On the right hand side here it tells me his current uh, combat level, a little bit of a bio on him and his total earnings uh, with me so far. So it gives you some background information. So to summarise, the role panel allows you to review, deploy and manage vehicles, fighters and crew members that you have assigned to your ship. Over on the right we have the systems panel. There are five subsections, five tab sections across the top. 
and the first one that you'll always see is your current status. Now this gives you some general overall information about your status with the Pilots Federation and also your uh, reputation and allegiance to the super fa superpowers and then the minor factions that you uh, will come, in co um, come into contact with in whatever system that you happen to be in at any given time. So on the left hand side you can see um, your rank with combat, trade and exploration as well as CQC at the bottom. Gives you current balance, the rebuy cost of your ship you're currently in, any local bounties you have and the, and the reputation that you have. On the right hand side you can see here the uh, reputation I have with the superpowers um, uh, and also the rank progression that is only applicable with the Federation and the Empire, there's no ranking up with the Alliance, um, but it's, it's here that you can check your progress uh, if you're looking to rank up with a particular superpower uh, to see uh, how far you've got until that next naval rank prom uh, promotional mission can make itself available um, allowing you to progress further on that level there. Um, underneath that you can see there's two uh, activation sections here for, for Hollow Me and for viewing the engineers. Um, Hollow Me, uh, if you select that, that's probably an area for another video which deals with the creation of your your character and your avatar and the engineers um, shows you your current status that you have with the engineers which again is perhaps something to go into more detail at another time but it just shows you this way you can access that information um, so now going back to the systems panel we can select above these areas and go into uh, a scroll bar for the right hand side which allows me to move down past the superpowers and into the system factions, the minor factions that exist within the system I'm currently in and shows my current reputation with them. Now if you look uh, at the title of this right hand column, reputation, you'll notice to the left and the right are the little arrows there which allows you to scroll and cycle through various additional information. Um, so for, for newer pilots that are perhaps unaware of that, this is an area that um, can, we can access additional information. So let's scroll across here and this gives you the control breakdown of the minor factions uh, within the system. So you can see here at the bottom that the uh, silver allied nets are quite predominantly uh, the dominating force in this in this particular system with the other minor factions holding a very small percentage themselves and these percentages sh shift and change uh, depending on where you are and they'll shift and change um, with this system as well because um, as we'll know the background simulation for Elite Dangerous is dynamic and can be influenced by player activity but that gives you the information of um, who's in control and what their current state is at the moment their state is all listed as none. This may change from anything to civil unrest, to boom, to a famine, um, and again, all down, linked down, down to the activities of the background simulation. We move across here, this shows me uh, my balance, the insurance um, levels, the rebuy costs. Um, here we have a full breakdown of the um, armor, shielding capabilities of the particular ship that I'm in, um, overall assets, claims, you can really scroll through here get a full breakdown of the activity that you've accrued in the time within your game. I won't go through all of this in, in too much detail because it'll be different for every player and it's fairly self-explanatory. Here the next section is deals with permits and this shows you all of the particular uh, regional or system permits that you have accrued in your time. Um, and you can see that I have um, a small list there of the systems that I managed to unlock. And then back down to the start into reputation. The next tab across is modules. Now this lists all of the modules, weapons and utilities that you currently have uh, installed on your ship and whether they're active or not. Uh, if you see on the immediate, the far left hand side, the little square next to each name is um, highlighted, which shows you that that system or that utility uh, module is, is active. Um, to deactivate that, we can select it and select the active, and that becomes deactivated. To reactivate it again, 
and select it again and it comes back online again. Some particular uh, systems will have um, a, uh, a reboot cycle. So for example, if I deactivate the frame shift drive and then reactivate it, there is a boot time which has to be taken into account. If you are activating and deactivating modules during flight um, and you need to do that process rapidly, you have to take into account sometimes the boot time. Now there's a fairly bit, fair bit of information in this uh, particular section. Um, it shows you the modules and weapons and so on, the, the grade and class, the type that they are, the amount of power that they draw, and the power priority that you have them set to, and their current health level. The, um, at the bottom of this, this particular page, you can see the total power output and then the usage output that um, the way that you built your ship currently, the, the demands that it has on the reactor in terms of power. Um, and you can also see that it's split up into the power priorities. Power priorities is something that I can touch on now because we are actually in this section and it is related to um, the, your bridge interface, uh, but there are some probably more detailed uh, descriptions and um, strategies that can be used with it that um, is perhaps for another video. But very quickly, it enables you to shift the priority uh, of power to any given module. So we see here the shield boost is set to, to power level priority two. I can move that to three or to four and uh, then back to one again. The idea being is that if you experience a loss in power, if your reactor, if your power plant takes damage um, through we weapons fire or thermal damage and its ability to produce um, its total megawattage is reduced, it, if you um, separate the modules, weapons and utilities into different priorities, it sets a power priority preference. So for example, those that have been given a priority level of three will be the first to be shut down and to uh, no longer require power from the reactor. This allows you then to keep critical systems active and operational and to disengage and shut down non-critical systems. So really, there's a few ways that you can approach this, but my particular recommendation is to keep the essential systems for flight and for escape with your ship as power level one. So your thrusters, your shields, frame shift drive, distributor, uh, your life support, sensors, power plant, they should all be the critical, um, they should all be a power priority one. They're all critical systems. After over and above that, I tend to put utilities and weapons into into uh, power priority level two, and then various other ancillary elements, cargo hatches, refineries, non-essential things, uh, into into priority three. So that way, if the ship sustains damage, and um, the reactor is unable to produce its total megawatt power output and it can't power everything, the non-critical systems will be the first to go down. If everything is set to power power priority one, that's telling the computer, the, the ship's computer, that everything is as important as every other element. And so if it can't power all of it, then it'll power none of it and your entire ship will shut down. And that can be a pretty serious problem. So it's always re recommended to actually split your um, power priorities into those sorts of categories. Priority one, critical systems. Priority two, weapons, utilities. Priority three, any other uh, ancillary elements that um, you have in the ship that are really not, you consider to be not critical. That's really the crux of uh, power priorities and what it's used for. You can select any particular uh, weapon or module or, or a utility and it gives you a little bit of information on that uh, that particular item, which is always handy. Um, and it gives you the percentage of power that each one is drawing from the total power output. You can see that um, some of the modules and uh, weapons have a little um, sort of hexagonal icon next to that just indicates that I've done some engineer modifications to those items, those modules. 
Um, so that really is, in a nutshell, the modules section. Um, and next we'll move on to fire groups. Fire groups lists all uh, weapons, um, controllers, scanners uh, that need to be assigned a fire group in order to actually function. Um, these fire groups then are translated to the head-up display, which we'll look at later, um, and tell you uh, which group they operate in. Now, I'm in a Type 9 Heavy and I use that for mining and trading. So, um, I have mine launchers, just purely for defensive measures only, but you can see I've got a prospector controller, a collector controller, uh, there's some mining lasers in there, again, a chaff launcher for defensive measure measures. So, for me, I am organising these fire groups into the order in which I'm likely to be needing to use them. So, during flight to and from a mining location, if I'm interdicted and I need to, to use defensive measures, the first fire group deals with mine launchers, chaff launchers, my defensive measures, basically. On arrival to a mining location, I want to be able to use the prospector. Um, and um, I've also got the data link scanner just tucked in there um, just because it needed a group to be uh, entered into. Once prospecting is done and I've found what I'm looking for, I then start to mine and collect. So these are then, uh, these elements are then grouped into the next section there. This is laid out particularly for mining, it'll be different for combat, it'll be different for exploration, but it allows you to assign primary and secondary fire to uh, various groups of um, weapons and modules that you have installed on your ship to achieve um, different capabilities. Um, if you want to split all your um, kinetic munitions based weapons from all your thermal based weapons that allows you to, to group them in those ways. Next we'll move across to inventory. Now in inventory it lists your ship cargo, giving you the total capacity at the bottom and whatever cargo you currently have in the ship. You're able to set filters here uh, by turning on and off these various filtering parameters. So if you're carrying quite a lot of cargo and you need to, to um, see what specifically relates to a certain filter, whether you quickly see whether what illegal cargo you're carrying, if you're worried about being scanned before you're entering a station, this is a handy way to get those set those kind of filters. As I said, I use this ship for mining, so I have a refinery on board. Um, if you don't have a refinery on board, this won't appear in this list, and this simply shows you um, the way what's in the hopper and which of the bins um, is being filled with what type of material that you've mined. Here we have your materials list and this gives you the list of all of the micro materials that you uh, either collect or are awarded on the completion of the mission throughout your um, gameplay and activity within the galaxy. And that lists everything that you might have and the quantities that you uh, have currently acquired you, uh, it also gives you the indication on the far right side of the grade of the material. So for example, an unknown fragment is very rare, but worn shield emitters that only have a single little sort of iconic pip in the middle, it just shows it's very common. Um, you can select that and it gives you a description of that particular item and the ability to discard um, one or more, depending on um, how many you currently have. Uh, in order to clear space um, because you do have a limit to how much you can carry. Uh, there's a thousand micro material items as you can see at the bottom and the same with the data on the next section below um, has a limit to it as well. So that gives you that particular capability. Now under materials this also has um, a, a, a filtering system. This allows you to filter by grade um, so you can um, select a particular element or something that's been manufactured uh, and then select whether if it's a grade 5 uh, material that you're after you can just filter just the grade 5 materials you've got to see to um, give you some control on that list information to access what you're looking for more quickly and more easily. The same thing applies with the data, it works in exactly the same way 
but these are just um, various different types of, of data that's been collected rather than micro-materials themselves. Uh, the filters work in the same way, the quantities, the information, uh, all that works in the same way and uh, helps you to manage and list and understand uh, the micro-material and data that you've collected. Synthesis, this allows you to uh, do on-the-fly crafting with the, um, the materials that you've collected. Now, this more specifically relates to um, surface materials um, that you've or, or that, that have been mined either on uh, on a planetary surface or in an asteroid belt um, where items like for example here vanadium or germanium um, have been collected and then they can be used to perform specific functions if we just hop back a second we can see these list of functions um, we can give a, a frame shift injection to, to the jump drive we can generate refills, more plasma-based ammunition, explosive munitions, small caliber munitions, and so on. And these basically relate to different weapon systems that are available uh, uh, and that can be installed on your ship. So, for example, multi-cannons would be a small caliber munition. Railguns would be high-velocity munitions. Um, missiles would be explosive munitions, and so on. Um, you can refill your auto field maintenance units, um, which is a module that allows you to repair other modules on your ship. When you're down on the planetary surface and you've got an SRV deployed, you can restock your ammo and repair and refuel. So this is on the fly synthesis to allow to rearm, repair and refuel either your ship or your SRV. Lastly is cabins. If you are doing passenger missions and you have cabins on board uh, and installed, this will give you an inventory of what cabins you have and how full they are and who's on board. Lastly, but by no means least, the functions tab. Uh, now this gives you some basic information on the left of the ship. Um, its current jump range, both laden and unladen. Uh, its name, its ID, and then you've got a list of, of core functions for ship activity. Um, faction relates to uh, joining a particular side when you have entered a conflict zone. Uh, two particular factions will be uh, in conflict with each other and you have the option to join one of those. And you do that by selecting the faction uh, from a drop-down menu. Um, when you're in an environment where there's no conflict going on, then this is uh, not selectable. This gives you information about whether your landing gear is deployed, whether your cargo scoops are retracted, where you have your, your wing beacon is on or off. If you're looking to join a wing, you can turn this on and it gives, sends out a wing beacon signal um, so that other wingmen can find you. Uh, this silent running allows you to close up your ship's thermal vents, um, basically to, um, reducing and minimizing your, your thermal signature and removing you from um, scanning systems and targeting systems. Uh, external lights, pretty obvious, flight assist um, on or off here. Rotational correction relates to um, uh, the ship's onboard automatic capability to match the rotation of um, any orbiting starport so that when you take off it will start to rotate the ship uh, so that you um, maintain your current level attitude uh, as you move out of the dock. If you turn this off you'll start to see that you'll immediately stay still and the ship starts to rotate, the, the docking bay rotates around you and so you have to manually input your own rotational correction. So this is very much just a, a particular preference for a pilot. The turret weapon mode, um, this can be toggled between um, targeting and forward fire. I don't have any turreted weapons on so I can't select this so you can just basically tell your turrets to just uh, fire either using their turreted self-targeting capabilities or to switch that off and just use them as a fixed forward firing weapon. Your pre-flight checks is more of an immersion feature that once you switch that on and then you go to launch your ship, um, the um, area around the comms panel on the top left of your, your sort of screen display is replaced by a list of pre-flight checks that um, just ask you to perform some basic functions 
to just to test that everything's working, but it's really more just for immersion rather than anything else. Uh, report crimes against me. This can be turned on or off. Um, this basically just uh, enables and disables the capability for um, logging uh, any crimes that you commit and any fines and bounties that are, are related to that. This can be toggled on or off. Orbit lines as you move around uh, system in Super Cruise, the, um, the trajectories, orbital tracks of all, all of the astronomical bodies that are found in there, including the stations and starports, um, will have orbit lines showing that they're, their movement paths. And this can be quite handy to allow you to align yourself up with um, wherever you're heading. Um, but it can be switched off. I often switch it off when I, I'm um, exploring, just to sort of clear the view up and, and improve the vista. Here you can just alter the interface brightness of your UI. The display clock can be turned on and off. Uh, your gun sight mode can be either leading or trailing, depending on what you prefer. Um, your sensor scale type can either be linear or logarithmic. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, reboot and repair. Um, this is a feature that is quite useful if you find that you've sustained damage through combat or through extended thermal exposure and some of your modules have gone offline so if you come across to the module section you may find for example that your frameshift drive is uh, redded out and is um, inactive and not working and not uh, so it means that you can't jump you have the option to do perform a full reboot and repair which can only be done in back in real space not in super cruise um, and uh, at a fairly stationary uh, um, forward attitude as well and it will shut the entire systems of the ship down and reboot everything and usually you can, can repair that module and bring it back online. Similarly also if you've sustained um, a, a, a lot of shield damage and your shields have collapsed a reboot and repair will bring them back online up to 50% so that's a handy feature but again you have to be virtually stationary um, or just traveling under something like 100 or 50 meters per second is quite slow um, before this will actually work properly so in a combat situation you need to make sure that you're in a safe environment before you perform that particular function so that really lists all of the functions within the systems tab and um, completes all of the information available in this particular panel Now the final sections to go over and review are your heads-up display and the forward console. Now both these areas are best reviewed once in flight as uh, all areas will become operational uh, at this time. So the best thing we can do now is to take off from this base and uh, get out into the black. Well we're back out on the pad so the next thing to do will be to launch and uh, take a look at some of the display features that you'll find on the head-up display and the forward console and also how they adapt and change depending on the situational environment that you're in. So I'll hit the launch. Straight away you can see that the central console display Takeoff procedure has been complete. replaced with the schematic of the ship and its location to the pad itself, allowing you to align up your landing properly. Because we are under 75 meters from the planet's surface, this is immediately replaced with a topographical map of the planetary surface and your ship. As we climb past that, that disappears and is replaced by the central scanner. Now as we climb out from the base, the heads-up display is giving us a variety of pieces of information to help us. First and foremost, we can see the altitude ladder directly in front of us and our current um, attitude in relation to the surface of the planet. So currently we're at zero degrees here. If we climb the nose up, we will be in an ascent of about five degrees here, or a descent of minus five degrees. Above that is our heading, which shows the direction we're currently moving towards. To the right of the altitude ladder is our uh, distance to surface indicator which currently shows that we're 1.59 kilometers from the planet's surface. The surface itself is indicated at the bottom of that scale. Below that we can see our coordinates and the gravity of the planet. 
These are important pieces of information, particularly the gravity of the planet itself. It's very important to know that piece of information when you're approaching a planet with intention of landing on it, and also in relation to the ship that you're flying. So for example, I'm currently in a Type 9, which is uh, a very heavy ship, it has a lot of mass, so I really need to know what the gravity of that planet is that I'm approaching. If it's a, a 2G world, uh, so a planet that has twice the amount of gravity that Earth does, I need to then adjust my flight profile accordingly and come in much more slowly and carefully, otherwise I'll hit that surface like a bloody meteorite and uh, do a lot of damage to the ship, if not destroy it in the worst case scenario. This is another instance where whenever I'm coming into land I will always, as a matter of course, divert power, full power, to systems to make the shields as strong as they possibly can be. The next area to look at are your weapons and utilities brackets that are shown in the heads-up display. At the moment, currently we can see to the left and to the right the utilities I have installed on this ship. So there's a chaff launcher and point defence. and also indicates the ammunition that there is uh, relating to those two uh, utilities. We also have our primary and secondary fire groups. So primary one and secondary one indicates the first fire group and what those primary and secondary weapons are. Um, and if I cycle through here, we can see that I've got up to th uh, three groups assigned with various weapons. Uh, once, the once the hard points are deployed, that those uh, brackets will remain in view and um, I can cycle through them accordingly. With them retracted, I can call them up and cycle through them providing that feature is bound on your keyboard or joystick um, and it will just give you an indication of what they are before disappearing. Next let's make an ascent away from the planetary surface and out into super cruise. Here I will start to engage the vertical thrusters and make an ascent. I'll put some forward thrust in as well and push nose up to increase our rate of climb, we should get a uh, confirmation from flight control that we've left the area of, um, of monitoring and control. Flight control, now offline. Goodbye, Commander. Thank you, Control. Now, when you're leaving the planet's surface, you'll always need to head directly 90 degrees up to hit that escape vector. So we're currently at 51 degrees. We need to move the nose of the ship up until we get to 90 degrees. If we look to the far right of the forward console, we can see that we're no longer mass locked. So we're free to engage super crews and leave the planet's surface. Now, the gauge on the right of the altitude ladder has altered. From the planetary surface, we now have two indicators, the DRP and the OC. The DRP is the drop zone from where you'll go into glide mode. OC is your orbital cruise level. So as you approach a planet and you move within its gravity will, well, I should say you should then drop into the area of orbital cruise. So these are stages that you pass through as you approach a planet's surface and they're indicated on this scale on the right. We can see the distance climbing up here as we're moving past 300 kilometers from the planetary surface. We've left orbital cruise, the altitude ladder and heading disappears and we're now in space flight. Okay, well we're now at the navigation beacon within this system. And this will give us a good opportunity to have a look at all of the various display elements that you'll find along the forward console as well as some additional elements of the heads up display. So with the forward console, uh, starting from left to right, we can see that on the far left is the target information window. This small window gives you a variety of pieces of information depending on what you target it. So if it's a ship, as it is in this instance, it gives us information on who that ship is, who the pilot is, what their combat rank is, and so on. 
If you're targeting a station or a base, it'll give you uh, distances uh, in terms of speed and um, this distance to target for correct dropout zone from supercruise, for example. So there's a variety of bits of information that are shown here. Whatever it is that you've targeted, it also appears as a small schematic uh, to the right of this information window. So we can see here we've targeted an eagle, and so that ship has appeared on this display in a three-dimensional model, and it gives you additional information in terms of the shield strength and hull strength. Now, just to the right of that, we can see a small circle, which is our compass. Now, this directly uh, relates to uh, whatever's been selected and targeted within our targeting window here. So, for example, here we've targeted the nav beacon. So the compass is actually um, tracking our position in relation to the navigation beacon. So we can see that there's a small white dot in the uh, upper left quadrant of the circle. That tells us that we have to move up in a sort of a 10 to 11 o'clock direction. And you saw that dot there pass from hollow to solid, which indicates that if it's solid, the target is in front of us. And now directly ahead, if we move away from it, that will, part will move from solid to hollow as we can see there. So now it's behind us. If we, can, if we stop that turn, it's now directly behind us. So that gives you an indication of your relation to whatever it is you've targeted using the compass. Next we move on to the Ford Central Scanner Array. To the left hand side of that central circle is the ship's temperature. This is an important gauge to monitor because it directly relates to the uh, heat output and performance of your ship. So at the moment we're currently idling at a low level of about 40%. Should this level increase, as it often does, using weapons, engaging the frame shift drive, or just simply circling too close to a, a star when you may be refueling, this will start to climb and rise. Um, any, any temperature levels that uh, hit around 110% around or higher will start to see module damage. So the percentages of health for your modules, which is shown in the second tab here, on the far right you can see everything is 100%, this will start to drop down. Um, if it drops too low, then those modules start to fail and malfunction. So that's an important area to uh, focus on. The next area to have a look at is the scale on the right hand side of the central scanner. This is your, your throttle indicator, the speed indicator in meters per second. So I'm currently traveling at 145 meters a second, um, which is um, quite close to the top end of the speed of this large ship here. As I move the throttle back, you can see that speed decreasing and then increasing. Because of, I have four pips to engines, as you can see on the distributor, on the far right there, those three capacitor scales. This allows me access to full engine power. If I move power away from engines towards systems, as we can see here, the maximum level of uh, engine capacity is reduced. You can see I can only move up to this level here, which you can see on the throttle indicator to the right of the sensor display. Move that back up to full power. If we disable flight assist, that scale changes. now have a different throttle indicator. Scan detected. It just simply shows the scale from zero to its maximum throttle. Flight assist off. Scan detected. Engaging that back on, we can see that there is also a little blue zone about halfway along that scale indicator. This is relevant both in forward and reverse thrust, and it indicates your optimum speed level for maximum maneuverability. So you'll be able to turn at the optimum speed once in this blue zone. Moving past that, faster than that, your turning arc will be slower. So it's an important area to remember during combat. Next we will have a look at the central scanner display. Now this is one of the most iconic pieces of um, display design 
in Elite Dangerous. It was um, originally uh, designed and coded by David Brayman himself when he uh, and Ian Bell designed the original Elite Dangerous game back in 1984 and it's made its way through to Elite, Elite Dangerous today. Um, it's a fantastic design, it works very well um, and I'm going to run through how it works right now. So at the moment we can see a variety of different contacts appearing on that scope and they give us a variety of different pieces of information. You can see that they are cur uh, currently appear on the scanner on the ends of stalks. Some are pointing up above the scanner plane, some are below that scanner plane and this indicates their position relative to you. So if the contacts are on the top of uh, vertically ascending stalks then they are above you and if they are below if they are pointing down they're below you so we can see two uh, contacts directly in front of us when I move to the at the top of the scanner display and if we pull the nose up we will then bring them horizontal to us now I can see that there they are now similarly the reverse is true if the contact is below you this also allows you to bank and orientate the, or reorientate the ship to bring various contacts into view uh, should you require so. The different shapes indicated tell you whether hard points are deployed or not. So a square contact has hard points retracted, a triangular contact has hard points deployed. If the contact is hollow, that indicates that it's a commander, another player in the game. If it's solid, as they all are in this case, then that indicates they're an NPC, a non-player commander. If the contact is uh, orange, as it is now, then it has um, a, a neutral um, status with relation to you. If the contact is green, then it indicates that they're allied and friendly to you. If the contact is red, then it is hostile. We can see that um, there is a white contact on the far edge of the scanner. Now that indicates um, a low wake or a high wake signature, which we can see in the contacts um, here. Well, it's just there we are. It's right at the bottom there. So it indicates that um, another ship has left the immediate area. So that just about uh, rounds up the scanner itself. There's only one more feature just to have uh, to a quick look at, and that's the ability to increase and decrease the range of the scanner itself. You can see there's a little yellow indicator along the just off center to the left of the bottom of the scanner. This indicates that the current sensor uh, array is set to minimum range. I can now adjust that and move it for, across to the far right to move to maximum sensor range. This gives you a, a variety of control to have a look at who is in your immediate vicinity to different levels. Next we will move across to the right of the central scanner to your own uh, schematic of your ship. And this uh, is a miniature three-dimensional model of your own ship which gives you an indication of your uh, attitude and position of the ship itself, your uh, shield strength, and the overall hull strength. To the right of that, we can see the power coupling, the power distributor. So you can see three capacitors that are fully charged there, sys, eng, and wep. So this is your systems capacitor, your engines capacitor, and your weapons capacitor. Currently, I have two pips into systems and four pips into engines. Now, just to uh, quickly cover what those uh, capacitors do specifically, uh, the system's capacitor primarily deals with shield strength. So the more pips you have into that capacitor, the stronger your shields will be uh, and the faster that they will regenerate. Um, having pips into the systems also um, gives power to various defensive measures. So things like chaff, ECMs will um, a charge and become active with um, power into systems. If that capacitor is empty, they'll go offline. Your engine's capacitor is fairly straightforward. It just gives you uh, access to varying levels of engine power depending on how many pips you have assigned to that capacitor. Four pips will see maximum thrust and uh, an ability to use your, your boosting 
um, capability. No pips to engines will see that capacitor gradually drain and you'll lose the ability to, to boost. Lastly, your weapons capacitor indicates the amount of power diverted to your weapon systems. Um, I currently have no pips to weapons, so if I were to fire my weapons, that capacitor would gradually drain uh, until it was empty and the weapons would stop firing. Um, the speed that that capacitor drains depends on the, um, the quality and level of the distributor itself and the weapons that you're using. So something that has uh, a high energy drain level, like a beam laser, will really drain that capacitor very fast. Something that, that has less so, say for example a fragmentation cannon, will um, be uh, much, more, much less demanding on that capacitor. There's one more little setting that you can see to the bottom in brackets RST, so it's reset. That just allows you to reset your um, distributor, like so, which diverts even power between all three. Now one of the questions that a lot of new commanders ask is, what is the optimum setting for your distributor? Well, the answer is there is no optimum setting. A good pilot has to learn how to manage your power coupling and the distribution of power to the various systems within your ship at a constant rate and it, it changes continuously depending on the environment that you're in, whether you're making an approach to a base or you're in combat. The requirements for that power and the even distribution of it will change continuously and the experienced pilot will learn how to manage that rapidly uh, to suit those environments. The final area to have a look at is on the far right of the Ford console. This little area of information gives you a range of different um, pieces of info relating to a variety of different things. Now that um, little active little wave bar at the very top that is, um, is sort of to have a sort of pulsating effect is your status indicator. Now this changes depending on whether you are, have a wanted status in this system or whether you're hostile. Uh, to this system, so if you're aligned to a different uh, superpower, if you're carrying illicit cargo, all these different types of scenarios are indicated in that status indicator there. Currently I have no uh, particular uh, status uh, that's, that's worth indicating uh, in relation to this specific system that I'm in. Underneath that you can see fuel levels. So I'm currently um, consuming 1.8 tons per hour operating my ship in the way that I am right now. Just below that you can see two lines. A small thin one that's just below the word fuel and a large thicker line below that. This indicates your fuel tank and your fuel reservoir. So the small thin line that's just below the word fuel uh, indicates that the fuel tank is actually well I'd say probably four-fifths empty. That line should stretch extend all the way across to the right indicating full fuel tank. When the fuel tank is empty, it'll immediately refuel itself or replenish itself by drawing from the fuel reservoir. So the fuel reservoir, the larger, thicker line below that, will then deplete. When you're using the frameshift drive to make a jump to hyperspace, the fuel requirement is much larger than the fuel tank can manage, so the FSD drive will draw directly from the fuel reservoir and you'll see a chunk of fuel uh, be removed from that. Um, and then the, the current fuel level will be updated accordingly. Uh, below that are various status indicators uh, which are labelled there. You can see whether or not you're mass locked. So as soon as you come into close proximity with a large um, body, whether it be a, uh, a ship, a station, um, a planet, all of these things can um, give you a certain level of mass locking which will inhibit the ability of the frame shift drive to move into action. The landing gear indicates whether the gear is up or down, and similarly with the cargo scoop, whether that's up or down. Okay, so I've just quickly jumped into a USS to show the cargo scoop in action. I've got a little micro material that's floating in space that I've targeted. Now if we deploy the cargo scoop, we can see that the little micro uh, schematic on the left will be replaced by a cargo scoop targeting window. Now if we just increase the forward thrust a little bit to close the distance to the target. You can see on the target information panel and in the heads-up display that our distance to target is reducing rapidly. 
because we're doing this manually we can't apply too much speed and I need to now adjust the ship's heading just to use that targeting window to line up with the micro-material and collect the item. Now we can retract the scoop and that task is complete. Well, that just about wraps up what was a pretty comprehensive tour of the flight deck on a ship in Elite Dangerous. Hope you found it useful. There was lots of information in there that you could refer back to at a later date. Also, don't forget to check the video description because there's timestamp links to specific areas of this tutorial in there. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you like the channel, don't forget to subscribe. And if you do, also don't forget to hit that bell icon because you just get little notifications of when new content has been added. Well, my name has been Commander Greywolf. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep it dangerous.